cool let's get started uh hi i'm kirthy i'm an f3 working in birmingham with an interest in peds so i'm just doing a bunch of peds topics for you guys uh we'll try and keep it very sweet and short so i'm going to do it in half an hour so that we can kind of focus on all the most important bits to do with scarlet fever and then hopefully you guys have a good understanding of it by the end of it so quick run through of bite medicine obviously as you guys know great medical education website um you've got questions cases i think they've got around 600 topics at the moment and then there's also a new feature where you can write notes by the side of it as well so you can kind of interact and change them as you need uh so on to scarlet fever so we're going to just talk through pathophysiology clinical features run through investigations and management and we're also i've also scattered some questions in there as well uh there's not a chat on here but there's a Q&A tab so I don't think you guys can see it but I can see them so whilst we do the questions if you want to just write the answers in there then yeah that should be fine um cool so we'll go straight into it with an SBA so nine-year-old boy comes into ED has a sore throat for the past few days and widespread erythematous rash and looking at his mouth his tongue is red swollen there's enlarged papillae and white coating as well so looking at his bloods you've got them all here and then observations wise it's a bit tachycardic and he's got a bit of a temperature as well so our first question is what is the likely causative organism based on the information there and feel free to write your answers in the Q&A tab so that I can see them. And I'll just count it down with like 10 seconds in my mind rather than spend too much time on them. So likely causative organism of these. So you've got sore throat, widespread rash, red swollen tongue with a white coat as well. And he's got a temperature and he's a bit tachycardic. And you saw the bloods as well. Yeah, we've got a few answers. Well done. It is strep hygienes. So just quickly to go through the other viruses in terms of what they do cause or what, what they commonly cause. So HHV6 causes roseola infantum, slightly different presentation. So you've got a bit chorizal there as well and a very typical rash of starting from the torso going to the extremities. Then there's coxsackie, which causes hand, foot and mouth disease more of a blistering, nasty rash on hands, feet and mouth and occasionally on the buttocks too. Strep pyogenes causes scarlet fever, as you guys guessed correctly. Um, strep viridens is an alpha hemolytic streptococcus that commonly causes an infective endocarditis. And then mobilla virus causes measles. So you've got fever, chorizal, conjunctivitis as well. And then you've got that red blotchy rash and you've got coplic spots, which are in the buccal mucosa, which are just these white spots. Uh, so going into, into scarlet fever, so a very infectious and highly contagious disease. You guys might have heard about it last year. It was a lot on the news because there was a lot of scarlet fever going around by group A strep. So I think there were, in terms of children coming to ED, coming to GP, there was a lot of patient concern, parent concerns in particular. So it's caused by the bacteria of the group A beta hemolytic streptococcus so it's a gram positive bacteria and the most common of that is strep pyogenes so over 85% of them are found in children so adult can get scarlet fever too but it's way more common in children especially under 10 years um, transmitted through aerosol transmission or even just by direct contact so even just kind of skin to skin almost uh, and it's most commonly affects age five to 15 years the incubation period two to three days and you can remain up to infectious up to three weeks and that's why treatment with antibiotics is very important because that it cuts down that infectious period by a lot so risk factors so this is more I've included for adults as well as just children so children is, is a big one because it affects them most postpartum women immunosuppression so diabetes malignancy it can be iatrogenic so any drugs like methotrexate steroids concurrent illness so if you've got varicella influenza flu as well IV drug use alcohol and dependency and overcrowding I guess just because the proximity it's just easier for it to spread 
So going into our next question, what are the characteristic features of scarlet fever? So we've got pharyngitis, the sandpaper-like erythematous rush and the strawberry tongue, fever coryza, coplic spots, conjunctivitis and a bread blotchy rash, or fever and malaise with a slapped cheek rash. And then you've got the rash starting on the torso to the extremities with the high fever and coryza. And finally, strawberry tongue, cracked lips, cervical lymphadenopathy and a rash within your palms and soles so i'll give you 10 seconds and you can guys can just check i guess you can just say a b c d or e and then write the whole thing out and that are the characteristic features of scarlet fever oh i am getting your answers so Feel free to write answers. Yeah, correct. It is A. So it's pharyngitis, so the sore throat, sandpaper-like rash, uh, and the strawberry tongue. So those are kind of characteristic. And especially in exam questions, those are the things that will make it stand out for you to go, yes, scarlet fever. Um, just to go through the other ones and what they do cause. So as we mentioned before, the coplic spots and the red blotchy rash, so that's measles. Um, that's quite a common one this, this winter in particular. We've had a lot of outbreaks. And then fever, malaise, and the slapped cheek rash is erythema infectiosum. And then you've got the rash starting on the torso to the extremities with the high fever and coryza. That's roseal infantum. And the last one with the cracked lips, similar with the strawberry tongue, because you get that also in scarlet fever, but you've got the lymphadenopathy and the rash, which is mainly your palms and your soles. That's Kawasaki. So going on to clinical features, so symptoms and signs, so symptoms, what the patient presents with. Um, so you've got sore throat, fever, fatigue, nausea and vomiting, headaches, are very kind of generalized symptoms, but it's more what you'll see that makes it scarlet fever. So signs wise, you've got the rash, it's widespread, red, blanching. It's got that sandpaper, very rough texture, particularly in the flexor creases, so kind of elbows, thighs, uh, begins on the trunk and you find that it's actually palm and sole sparing. So you've also got the strawberry tongue. I'll show you pictures in a second. So strawberry tongue, which is red, you've got white exudate um, and just these enlarged papillae all over your tongue. And then the foreshimer spots, which is the pet the petechial spots on the hard and the soft palate, so inside your mouth. So that's why examination of, of like the ear, nose and throat, very, very important. Uh, you can sometimes get cervical lymph lymphadenopathy, which you kind of tend to see quite a lot in children in general even with just fluey like symptoms um and then facial flushing with this circumoral pallor so red cheeks but kind of pale around the mouth so that's an example of strawberry tongue so as we said the white coat the enlarged papillae um yeah quite a swollen tongue as well and then this is the facial flushing with the circumoral pallor and then you've got the sandpaper rash. So just to see it on different skin tones as well. So I can get another child, but essentially you won't see the redness as such, but you'll definitely see that texture. You'll feel, you'll see it and you'll feel it, I guess. And it's quite, quite raised. Um, but yeah, so on to investigations. So in general, oh, by the way. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Someone's just asked about the chat. So unfortunately, um, the chat is disabled because I think it's it goes through the streaming website as well. So it's not a feature. But if you put any questions in the Q&A tab, I can read them so I can answer them as well at any point. Yeah. Um, so investigations, throat swabs and blood tests, we don't routinely do. It's quite clinical diagnosis. Um, but you can consider throat swab for group A strep, so bacterial throat swab. You tend to do it if it's you're uncertain about the diagnosis, um, if you have if it's suspected as part of a public health outbreak. So last year in particular, when during peds, when I was on peds, we were kind of doing bacterial throat swabs for most patients if they came in with sore throat, carousal symptoms, just to see if it was group A strep, um, because it's also a notifiable disease too. 
and penicillin allergy. So when you do bacterial throat swabs, you get a, a list of sensitivities. So then it can help guide the antimicrobial choice because not all of them are sent, or not all antibiotics are going to be sensitive. Um, and if they're in close contact of high risk individuals, so as we kind of saw at the start, so it can be postpartum women, immunosuppressed individuals. So if they're if the child or the patient is in close contact, then you probably do it just to make sure to know in terms of isolation. And then the blood test wise, you, as we saw at the start, you can do blood tests just to look at inflammatory markers, so CRP white blood cells, and if you're concerned about any post-infection complications. Um, and another thing that you can do is the anti-strep to lysin O antibody titus. So it basically tells you if there has been previous infection and how, and it kind of gives you the values of how high those levels are as well. So it's not important it's in the immediate, like during the infection, but in kind of following for post-strep like complications, like two weeks down the line or three or four weeks down the line, then it's quite useful because you can see if the patient had been infected with group A strep, so it helps guide your diagnosis a bit more. Um, cool, so our next uh, question. So here we have an eight-year-old, comes to the GP with a dad, has a sore throat for several days, widespread red sandpaper-like rash. She's got flushed cheeks and her tonsils are red and swollen and she has no allergies. And the throat swab has been sent, but we're waiting for the results. So observations, tachy slightly maybe tachycardic, 110. Um, but again, with eight-year-olds, it's, it's not too bad to have that. Um, temperature, she's she's febrile. And she's maybe got a slightly, yeah, that's fine, actually. Maybe slightly working hard in terms of breathing, but she's probably a bit distressed. Um, so what is the first-line treatment for this child's condition? So we, we know what we're dealing with so what yeah I'll give you 10 seconds and if you guys can just answer which what do you think we treat scarlet fever with wait a few more seconds as I said, I am getting your answers, so feel free to type in the Q&A tab. Right, so it's phenoxymethyl penicillin or penicillin V, if you might have heard it that way. Uh, on to why, so, or, or what the other ones are for. So with benzyl penicillin not indicated in this, I think you see it quite a lot in infective endocarditis in particular it's, it's the top the first line for quite a few of those scenarios but penicillin v is your first line treatment or phenoxymethyl penicillin for scarlet fever and the duration is a 10-day course so azithromycin and clarithromycin we can give in penicillin allergy so it's your second line drug so azithromycin you'd give for non-pregnant adults and if the children are over six months with clarithromycin you can give at any age from newborns up till whenever but just not excluding pregnant women and then oral fluids and simple analgesia so because it's a bacterial infection it should be treated with antibiotics so failure to treat increases the chances of post-strep complications as well as it results in a as well as um, it causes, it lengthens the infectious period as well. So you're probably going to be spreading it for a lot longer. I think someone's asked me what the difference is between benzyl pen and phyroxymethyl penicillin. I don't know the pharmacological difference between the two, but they are definitely different drugs. And so benzyl penicillin is not given for scarlet fever at all. Um, so sorry, I don't, maybe I'll get back to you on that one, but I don't actually know what the yeah how they differ yeah cool so management wise um for mild to moderate illness so general advice you're bound to give kind of simple analgesia get the fluid intake increased um benzidamine throat spray so because of the sore throat and kind of that 
that sore tongue a lot of children will go off their food and drink so it's so important to get them to drink because they can get dehydrated quite quickly and then to help with that you can give them the benzidabine throat spray or you might have heard it as diflam spray so that is basically an NSAID drug which is just a throat spray and it helps just like a local anesthetic and it helps with the inflammation so that's why we do that and I think it can be used several times a day so helps to just boost their oral intake antihistamines because it is very itchy and then calamine lotion which you might have seen um sometimes these in chicken pops as well uh but any kind of emollient you'd probably recommend uh so first line as we said phenoxymethyl penicillin for 10 days and we talked about penicillin allergies so admission may be required if there's severe symptoms if there's suspected life-threatening complications, which will come across soon, and then high risk of developing complications. So usually tends to be immunosuppressed children. Um, also, it's a notifiable disease. So you, you will be referring to Public Health England. So depending on where you're at, you, can, you probably might do the form yourself by going on the Public Health England website, or it's kind of just getting in touch with the infectious diseases team so that they're aware because I think they will do it if you're in a hospital. And then advice is important to prevent transmission. So making sure they stay away from nursery, school or work for at least 24 hours from your first dose of antibiotics. Um, it's known that I think you can spread it, uh, as we said, because if you're not on antibiotics, it just increases that infectious period. So starting antibiotics, you just need 24 hours. And I think that kind of helps with bringing down the infectious time to literally a very small, like only 24 hours. So make sure they, are, they stay away from work and make sure compliance to medication as well. Encourage effective hand washing, avoid sharing towels or utensils and avoiding contact with high risk individuals. And then high risk contacts also might require exclusion from nursery school or work. And sometimes in some cases we give antibiotic prophylaxis as well. Uh, let's check if there's any questions. No, cool. So next one is, well, I think this is our last one maybe. Uh, so a 10 year old attends her GP with her mum. She's had a sore throat for two days and it doesn't seem to improve it. And when you look at her, her tongue, her tongue is red, swollen, again, in large papillae with the white coating. These are very, the reason why those words have come up quite a few times is because they're very typical to describe that strawberry tongue, um, to not kind of be as obvious and say strawberry tongue in a question. So that's why we've included it a few times. And a widespread rash as you've got here. So observations so she's got a bit of high temperature but otherwise maybe a little bit tachycardic but that's about it so what complication of her underlying condition typically occurs at a later date so you've got meningitis peritonsillar abscess otitis media pneumonia and acute glomerular nephritis so yeah, I guess, which, what is a complication of scarlet fever? That's more of one that comes on later on. So again, feel free to answer in the text. You can just put them into A, B, C, D, E as well. If it's easier. Yeah, we'll just wait a few more seconds for a few more answers. Cool. Okay, so it is acute glomerular nephritis. So we, yeah, let me talk through. So meningitis is a rare but more of an acute complication of invasive group A strep. And then you've got the abscess, which again is an acute suppurative complication. Um, and it can be either in the peritonsilla, the pharyngeal or the retropharyngeal area as well um otitis media so that again is also something that's more earlier on during infection and pneumonia also another acute complication but acute glomerular nephritis is something that comes on typically two weeks post-infection so just going through the complications again a bit more detail so it's either it's kind of 
split into three different types. You've got superative or non-superative, so the pus formation and the non-pus formation ones. So the non-pus formation complications typically occur at a later stage. Um, so you've got, we'll talk through the pus formation ones first. So those are throat abscesses, acute sinusitis, otitis media, and mastoiditis, kind of any secretion -y or collection of pus kind of, yeah, that's all of those. And then you've got your non superative and those consist of rheumatic fever. So including the heart, uh, two to three weeks post-infection, not something you see as much nowadays, thankfully, and post-strep glomerulonephritis, and that's also two weeks post-infection. So small complications, and these are the more invasive group A strep in infection complications, some more rarer ones, but very severe. Um, so you've got streptococcal pneumonia, meningitis and cerebral abscess, endocarditis, septic arthritis, liver abscess, cellulitis, neck fash, and streptococcal toxic shock syndrome as well. So there's quite, you can see why it's, you know, it it's such a big deal when it is, when, when you do get outbreaks, it's because it the complications themselves are very, very severe. And so treatment and recognition and education is very important if you're suspecting it. And that's it. So we finished a bit early, actually. But as I said, I kind of prefer to keep them quite short and sweet because I always found that those webinars were more helpful rather than having to sit through like a really long one. Um, if anybody would like to um, ask me any questions, you can ask in the Q&A. As I said, I can see them. So um, feel free to ask in there. And then I've also put a feedback form QR code there, so I'd really appreciate it. And there's also things, if there's certain topics that you want me to talk about going forwards, feel free to put them on there as well. So then it just helps me gauge what people want to know more about. And then feel free to email me as well. I've had a few emails in the last few sessions that I did, so I don't mind being emailed as well. But yeah. So I'll keep that on for, for a bit longer, but as I said, Feel free to ask any questions, but that's it. So you can leave whenever you're done. Thank you for joining and I'll see you next time. I'm going to be doing croup next time. Yeah. Have a lovely evening.